uh, both New York, North Carolina, a variety, universities, more of a quasi-governmental agency. I mean, you, you've had a variety of, of, uh, uh, of information uh, protection background. How far behind or ahead would you rank the archives and what, what you're walking into in terms of, in comparison to those uh, other sectors you've worked in? Is your question around technology or is it around protection of collections? Both. Okay. Uh, in terms of technology, it feels very similar to probably the environment 15 years ago uh, in terms of um, what I would describe as everyone doing their own thing. Um, this figure that I cited, $80 billion a year on information technology, is a huge, huge figure. Um, and the, um, it reminds me very much of a university environment years ago where every department was able to, to do their own thing, buy their own systems. Um, and then enterprise systems came in and, and um, you know, kind of reduced the costs associated with that. So I've, there's some of that that I see um, at, at work now. I think that some of the ideas around um, cloud computing that I'm hearing um, will address uh, some of those, those issues. And there are some examples of enterprise systems that are underway, but it is in early stages, I would say reflective of the, the amount of money that's being spent. On the collection side, we have established a, a holdings uh, protection task force. Um, we are, we have some, uh, as you know, we've had some problems uh, in terms of um, materials that are lost and we're serious about correcting those problems and creating a sense of um, urgency around that within the agency, all 44 facilities across the country. Would you, is it a greater challenge in your view the electronic uh, protection of electronic data rather than some of the, well, our traditional paper um, forms uh, of data uh, collection. I mean, do you, do you have sort of a, it's, a it's greater more, concern with one? It's more, it's more complicated. Um, it's more complicated because of um, threats to um, access to destroy uh, electronic information to um, change it. And so uh, ensuring the authenticity of that original um, electronic record uh, are certainly more complicated than in the paper environment. Okay. Because uh, archives certainly has a, a long history of being able to, you know, protect that traditional uh, data. And to ensure that 100 years from now you're looking at what was originally uh, created. Exactly. And is that part of the struggle is being able to create a system by which future generations will be able to retrieve this electronic. And that those, those digits get migrated as technology changes, exactly. All right, well thank you. Thank you for your candor. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, Mr. Wintergren, the uh, DOD has established a standard for records management applications that has been endorsed by NARA. Uh, is this something that the department simply created once or is it continually uh, revised and improved? Yes, sir. It's a continuing process. We have actually dozens of tools from companies, many different companies, different operating systems. We have a whole market basket of uh, tools that have gone through this compliance process. And so, you know, we look at them, we make sure that they're going to meet the needs, and then we publish those lists of uh, preferred products, if you will. And then our agencies can go buy those products and be assured that they're going to get a product that works for them. Um, with NARA's endorsement, it's sort of opened the door to others to take advantage of that, too. So we both have examples inside of the Department of Defense. Uh, the Navy, for example, has a records management compliant product. It's on hundreds of thousands of desktops. It uh, has millions of records. So we, we have great successes within the department of people using those tools, but now we have a lot of interest from others. So we have other federal agencies, states, local governments, even some other nations that have come to find out you know, what these preferred products are and how they could take advantage of using them, too. So you're pretty much spreading the spreading the gospel, so yes, to sir. say, to other agencies yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, and to other countries. About yes, sir. To, that's the prize. If we could align to secure products that work well and are interoperable, that's always the best approach. So we're happy to have any agency come ask us for the information about how we do the compliance process. The, the products that are certified are available on a website, so anybody can go look at them and, and then go buy the one that they choose. Exactly how many? agencies would you estimate have adopted some of your practices? 
See, I, I don't have a good answer on that, sir, because what I know is that, uh, that lots of people come and ask for information. But, you know, at DOD, I don't keep track of then what they go and buy. So I have a list of, like, literally 80 or 90 organizations that have come and asked for us about how do you do the certification testing how, and all that sort of stuff. But then, but then we don't keep track if, you know, the state of Illinois came and was interested. We don't actually know whether they would go and buy them or not because they would go buy them directly from the vendor. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, Ms. Melvin, examining the uh, challenges of electronic records is not something new for GAO. Uh, how, however, this administration has been more proactive about transparency than previous presidents. How will the Open Government Initiative help with electronic records management? Well, the open government um, directive that was put in place does have within it a requirement that agencies include in their plan open government plans uh, a link to a website that would um, uh, provide information on their record records management programs. Ask you about uh, members of Congress. A lot of us have blackberries. Uh, we have official business on here. We also may get uh, may get an email from our children, from our parents, from our wives saying, uh, on your way home, would you stop at the store and get some milk? I mean, we, is it up to the members to decide what is official and, and, and what, is, what is not? And, and if, if we wanted to save our records uh, for our offices, I mean, we pretty much make that determination? That's one of the critical issues uh, that we point to in the statement that I provided to you today. From the standpoint of email in particular, there, there are numerous challenges relative to the complexity, uh, relative to the content, uh, the context of the email messages. And one of the, um, and this is in light or, 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 or around the context that um, historically getting users to really be responsible for records management is a difficult task. So you're compounding that by asking them to identify specific emails that may be a record or a non-record. Um, it's still a challenge. It's one of those that we point out is very critical for agencies to have to um, make a determination and as a part of their records management programs how, in fact, they are going to define what a record is, what an email record is, and how they will categorize that information versus personal or non-record information. It's a very difficult task. Anyone else on the panel have any suggestions about how to determine Mr. Winogrin? Well, sir, I don't know that I have a suggestion, but you have hit upon one of the crucial challenges as you move to this electronic records management world is that, you know, in the old days, you, you wrote a letter and you had somebody who was uh, the correspondence clerk and they knew to archive that letter. But, but indeed, now everyone from our junior enlisted personnel to our senior admirals and generals, right, you have to decide you're creating a record and then, you know, make sure it's it's that the email from your wife is deleted and the email that's a record is saved. And so again, one of the things that we all need to work on together is making sure that the tools that are electronic tools are available, take advantage of metadata and things like that to try to help make those decisions for you so the user isn't stuck trying to make those decisions on their own. I see, I see. Thank you very much. And let me thank the panel of witnesses uh, for their testimony today. This, this panel is dismissed. Thank you.
Okay, everyone um, situated. Okay. Uh, I would now like to introduce our second panel. Um, even though none of the witnesses are Maryland Terps, we welcome them to this hearing. Our uh, first witness will be Dr. Gregory Hunter, a professor at the Palmer School of Library and Information Science at Long Island University. CW Post Campus. He is director of the certificate program in archives and records, records management at LIU. He received his PhD in American history from New York University and is a certified records manager and certified archivist. And welcome to the committee. Our next witness is Ms. Carol Brock, her, here today representing. ARMA International, Ms. Brock is a certified records manager with 23 years experience. In 2007, with Ms. Brock's leadership, a GAO earned the Archivist Achievement Award. She is currently pursuing her PhD in Digital Preservation and Information Policy at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, after Ms. Brock, we will hear from Ms. Ann Wiseman. Uh, Chief Counsel for Citizens for Ethics and Responsibility in Washington. Ms. Wiseman works extensively on access to federal electronic records as well as transparency in government. She previously served as Deputy Chief of the Enforcement Bureau uh, at the Federal Communications Commission and as an Assistant Branch Director at the Department of Justice. I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimonies. And of course, it is the policy of the subcommittee to swear you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that the witness is answered uh, in the affirmative. I ask that each witness now give a brief summary of their testimony. Please limit your summary to five minutes. Your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. And Dr. Hunter, please begin with your opening statement. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, I do want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Uh, the only thing that I would add to my background that you did, you did mention is that in addition to my university work, I, I did... Uh, have a career as a working records manager. I was manager of corporate records for ITT World Headquarters, and before that I was archivist for the United Negro College Fund. So I come by my teaching this honestly, uh, having done it for many years, and I continue to consult uh, for uh, government and organizations in this area as well. Uh, we did hear in, with the previous panel about the status of electronic records management. I didn't think I would be able to add anything to what we had just heard. I thought I could perhaps add to the committee's deliberations by talking a bit about some, breast, uh, some uh, best practices from the private sector, from my experience in, in my 30-year career that may be applicable to some of the issues that the subcommittee is wrestling with. In my written testimony, there were several areas that I discussed at length. Today, I am just going to uh, highlight briefly a couple of those areas for you. Uh, the first area deals with the definition of a record. And uh, the GAO reports that were mentioned pre uh, previously have one theme in common, that the agencies are spending a great deal of time sorting out what's a record from a non-record. And your example with the BlackBerry is, is relevant as well to this, that this consumes a great deal of agency time. Uh, and there's a reason for this, certainly. The records have to be managed according to federal requirements, whereas the non-records don't uh, maintain that burden. What, uh, what I want to suggest is that in the private sector, what I believe people are moving toward is less of a focus on record or non-record. In the world of electronic discovery, electronically stored information is what is discoverable, not record or non-record. And uh, the definition of a federal record certainly is in law now, but uh, the subcommittee may want to begin at the very beginning, perhaps, in its deliberations and decide whether or not the existing definition of record and non-record uh, legacies from the 1950s really are fruitful for our current discussion. In the private sector, organizations will define much more as record. Many of those records have short-term value, but by defining them in that way, we spend less time sorting out record from non-record, and we spend much more time trying to manage those resources efficiently. 
So that's uh, the first area in the written testimony talks about record versus non-record. The second area is the status of uh, records management. And uh, if people don't understand what a record is, certainly there'll be difficulty having them understand what records management is and why they should care about that. In the written testimony, I, go, I spend some, some length talking about pushing responsibility for records management down within the hierarchy. That records management has to be seen as, as something helping someone's business processes. It has to be seen as something that it's worth doing uh, because it assists the agencies, not just because there's a requirement for that. So making records management, emphasizing the customer service aspect of it, pushing responsibility down the organizational chain. I, I know we're dealing with big problems, $80 billion worth of budget but, and electronic tools to help solve this, but this still ultimately is a people profession and a people problem and pushing that responsibility down the, down the chain, making managers, not just the agency heads, but frontline managers responsible for the implementation of records management policies and procedures. In the private sector, that's done through the human resources structure, making certain that records management responsibilities are detailed in your job description, that you're accountable for it, that you're reviewed on that. So I do, uh, I do recommend both for managerial responsibility and records liaisons that uh, NARA and agency staff look at ways to push that responsibility down. Uh, one, uh, one last thing that I would like to talk about just a bit, because I know compliance is a concern and has been a concern in the previous panel. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about compliance and again talk about a, a private sector model. And the private sector model is that the most successful records management programs within corporations are working with the people in the organizations responsible for compliance. They are partnering with, uh, in, the, in the corporate world, the compliance departments that were established after Sarbanes-Oxley in particular. In the university settings, this is working with internal audit. And I do want to, uh, to point out to the committee that one of the best models of this is a project done by Indiana University under funding from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. They did establish uh, guidelines for working with internal audit to the success of both parties. So let me conclude with just a couple of remarks. Uh, technology as a way of bringing issues to the fore. And before the testimony, uh, as I was preparing this testimony, I was rereading a report from 06 about new technologies and agency responses to that. Agency managers were concerned about efficiency. Legal counsel was concerned about evidence. What was interesting to me, though, was that the report was from 06, from 1906, not 2006. The report was by a group called the Keep Commission, and they were very concerned about federal agencies implementing the change from the older technology of letterpress books to the brand new technology of carbon paper. So, uh, th so the issue sounded strangely familiar to me, and maybe in 2106, uh, your successor will be here with a slightly different twist on this. Uh, but I, I do believe, and you'll see in the written testimony, I, I talk much more about private solutions, and I believe that this kind of dialogue, public-private uh, discussions, will lead to some of the best practices, and we hope that, uh, as citizens, that it will help federal agencies as well as private sector organizations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Appreciate that analogy from the other century. Uh, Ms. Brock, you may proceed. Thank you, Chairman Clay and members of the subcommittee for inviting ARMA International to this hearing on federal electronic records management. I have been a federal records management professional for 23 years and have served several federal agencies and worked closely with the National Archives in my role as a federal records officer I am an active member of ARMA International, the Association for Information and Image Management, and the Federal Information and Records Managers Council. We have been producing electronic records since the 1980s, yet we are not adept at managing them. In an effort to better address electronic records management issues, I returned to school a year ago to work on a PhD in digital preservation and information policy. You can understand that this is near and dear to my heart. The question of the day is, why are electronic records so difficult to manage? I will address three reasons why. First, managing electronic records inherits all of the traditional records management challenges. Second, managing electronic records is fraught with technology challenges and requires consistent records management competencies. 
And third, managing email poses additional challenges. I also provide some recommendations, including first, empowering and funding NARA, second, establishing a role for an agency chief records officer, and third, establishing a principle-based approach to records management. So what are the traditional records management challenges? There may be no management involvement or expectations. Senior officials do not see records management as a vital agency function. Also, there are no meaningful or sustaining resources. There are limited staff resources to do mission critical work. Agencies no longer have support staff to perform administrative tasks, and workloads continue to increase as staff numbers decrease. No staff training or imperatives exist. Records management awareness requires continuous enterprise-wide training. Still, many federal agency staff do not see their work product as records and simply do not have time for training. Also, no enterprise-wide guidance or expectations exist. Record status is generally determined at the end user's desktop. Staff mingle personal materials with their business records. What are the technology challenges associated with managing electronic records? Technology is not a constant. Principles are constant. Electronic media obsolescence is a well-known issue. If technology is not reliable, let's employ generally accepted record keeping principles. More records does not equal better record keeping. Popular wisdom is to save everything because storage is cheap. This perception overlooks the costs of staff searching for information to do their jobs, as well as the costs of fulfilling FOIA, privacy, and discovery requests. Also, records management must be consistent across the enterprise. Agency staff are as wired as everyone else. Staff are storing records on hard drives, thumb drives, home computer systems, and in the cloud, all of which are outside of an agency's centralized span of control. Finally, what are some additional challenges associated with managing email? Staff use email for personal productivity, to manage their projects, store their drafts and reference materials, find their records and track their work. Used in these ways, email may never make it into the agency's official record keeping systems. Identifying records is not as easy as creating email, and email capture can be complicated. So what we can do? We can confirm our benchmarks, the National Archives guidance, the ISO standards on information and documentation, and the generally accepted record keeping principles. Also, we can create expectations and public policy outcomes. What is needed is a commitment to create, manage, and grow a compliant records management program. If Congress declares agency records management a priority and links agency budgets to compliance, we will see results. Consider establishing chief records officers in each and every agency. And I could say more on that later. We can give NARA greater visibility and authority, insisting on proven agency compliance with scheduling, dispositions, and effective management of electronic information assets. My perception is that NARA does not have the authority to fulfill their record keeping mission. And finally, we can integrate enduring records management principles into the operations of every federal agency. An agency should establish a record keeping program that is overseen by senior executives, informed by clear policies and procedures to train and guide personnel, and is transparent through documentation available to all personnel, interested parties, and regulatory and enforcement bodies. And I have a copy of the principles and detailed maturity model, if anyone would care to see it. Thank you again for this opportunity to comment. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Brock, for your testimony. Ms. Wiseman, you may proceed for five Mr. minutes. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McHenry, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today about the status of federal electronic records management. I last testified before this committee in December 2009 on the priorities and roles NARA and new archivist David Ferriero